Amen. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. So this morning is the fifth Sunday in the season of Eastertide. And it's also, obviously, I, I would imagine at this point, our monthly all-family Eucharist service. So the church's vision is to be a multi-generational family of Christ followers who are characterized by worship, community, and mission. So one way that we live out that vision is by inviting our children to be a part of our sermon time once per month. Now we realize that children and adults have different maturity levels and different cognitive abilities, so there are lots of opportunities for age-appropriate teaching for the children. However, once a month we like to keep everyone together for a few reasons. The first is that it gives our children the opportunity to practice what we hope they will do for the rest of their lives. Rather than being catered to on every level, we let them grow in maturity together with us. Second, it gives, it gives us adults better understanding of what it looks like to come to the Lord with childlike faith. Jesus goes as far as to say, unless we become like a little child, we will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What a blessed gift it is for us to have the opportunity to learn from our youngest brothers and sisters. Finally, it is how we live out our beliefs and values. We believe that our children are our covenant children and therefore are full members of the family of God. This doesn't mean that they don't have to take personal responsibility for their faith one day, but simply that we catechize them into the faith from day one rather than expecting some sort of conversion moment someday. So we'll show a little bit more grace today to the extra noises that are going to be around us inevitably because having our children with us is good for them and it's good for us. Right. Thanks be to God. So if you have your Bibles and you would like to follow along this morning, open with me to John chapter 14 and we'll be focusing on verses 15 to 21. All right, children, are you with me this morning? All right. I've got a a, a few questions for you this morning, and I'll, we'll begin with just one question. But first, you need to put your thinking cap on. Can you put your thinking cap on for me? Put on your listening ears. All right, great. So here's my question. Are you listening? All right. Can I see your eyes if you're listening? Awesome. Have you ever felt alone or by yourself? Yeah. <laughs> maybe it was when everyone in your house was too busy to play with you. Or maybe your friends didn't want to play the game that you wanted to play, and therefore you felt all alone. Remember that feeling with, with me, if you will. Keep it in your mind, and we'll come back to it in just a minute. See, one time when I was eight or nine years old, my family went on vacation to the beach. And we did lots of sandcastle building. We did lots of swimming in the ocean and playing in the waves. But the experience that I'd like to talk about this morning is something else that we did while we were at the beach. And this is the first, it was the first and only time that I've ever gone deep sea fishing. So if you don't know what that is, basically you get on this, this fairly large boat and you go really far out in the ocean, so far that you can't even see the land and you try to catch fish. So I caught several fish that day, including an eight and a half pound mahi-mahi, which was the largest fish caught on the boat that day. Just saying. It was a remarkable day for those points alone, but that wasn't all that happened that day. See, I have suffered my whole life from motion sickness. Not the kind that causes me to vomit, but the kind that just makes me feel miserable and, and like I want to go to sleep. 
Does anyone else get car sick? Does any of your children get car sick? Well, that day the ocean was particularly rough. So my no- normal car sickness was cranked up to, to level 11. And I also, for the first time that day, learned what seasickness was. I remember thinking about how all I wanted was to be alone, to be left alone in order to be somewhere quiet that I could calm my, my stomach and be able to rest until I could feel better and be able to get back to fishing. So there, though on this boat that day, were about three or four big families. And no matter where you went on the boat, there were people, loud people. When I just wanted to sit alone in my misery, my mother stepped in, as she is known to. This is one of my favorite memories with my, with my mom. Basically, I curled up in a sort of ball on her lap until I was able to find some relief. She gave me good advice on how to feel better, keep drinking water, maybe try to eat something, and, and perhaps more importantly than anything else, she just comforted me. So let's go ahead and remember that memory of the time where you felt alone. Is it back in your head? That feeling? See, we all have these moments in our lives where we feel like we are all alone. Sometimes our aloneness comes from others. Sometimes, like mine, it comes from our own desire to separate ourselves from others. But deep down inside, we always feel the desire for guidance and companionship. We see the psalmist express this sense in Psalm 23, verse 4, when it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff shall comfort me. When things are going poorly, we feel all alone. We want someone else to step in and to tell us how to feel better, to wrap their arms around us and tell us that everything is going to be okay. We want to hear the comfort of a dear friend. We want to feel the comfort of our mother's arms. When we feel alone, we long to be comforted, simply. This, interestingly enough, I believe, brings us to our reading from John's Gospel this morning. We're here together in 2024 with Easter in our rearview mirror, and historically speaking, another couple thousand Easters in our rearview mirror. So when we come to this section of John's Gospel, we know the full story, right? We, we have to remember, though, that our passage this morning comes... Before all that, though, and I believe this will be helpful for us in order to understand what's going on here. So for this passage, we have to step back for a moment into Holy Week for a few minutes. See, in John's Gospel, after the Passover meal, Jesus, where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, he washes the feet of the disciples. This is what we focus on on Monday Thursday. He then predicts Judas' betrayal. He foretells Peter's thrice denial. And then Jesus teaches the disciples on what's to come. Sort of the farewell discourse as it's become known. We know what happens, right? We know Easter happened. The resurrection happened. But the disciples in this moment, in the moment of our passage being recorded, were hearing all of these negative things that were happening in the city of Jerusalem. And they were getting scared. Perhaps they were remembering the times that Jesus told them that he was going to have to suffer and die. Perhaps they were seeing the the proverbial writing on the wall in the city as the religious leaders began to stir up the crowds against Jesus. Maybe they could see the way that things were going to end. There's only one way that this can end. And they were beginning to be fearful. So Jesus takes this opportunity, right, to alleviate some of their fears. Knowing this, he tells them that for those who love him and those who keep his commandments, another will be sent to help and to comfort them. Our text says another helper, specifically. If you're looking at your Bible, 
you'll notice that helper in this passage is capitalized. That's a weird thing to be capitalized in a sentence if you know anything about the English language. But because rather than a sort of general and unspecific helper, we see here a reference to an incredibly specific helper. So in Greek, this word is translated, the word translated as helper here is parakletos, or paraklete is kind of how it's transliterated often into English. This was a common word in Greek. It's not a special Bible word. It's not something that's been co-opted in, in a new way. This is a normal word in Greek culture to mean legal counsel. <laughs> but it also carried a sort of connotation of encouragement as well. Advocate is another way that it's often translated in different versions. It is someone who will shoulder the burden with us and help us. It's interesting because John uses this word five times. Five times in, in all of his writings across the New Testament. Four of them occur in chapters 14, 15, and 16. This farewell discourse where he's teaching the disciples about what's coming next. And there's one other time he uses it. And it should be one that it's incredibly familiar to all of us because we say this verse every single time that we gather. In 1 John chapter 2... And specifically, the second half of verse 1 and verse 2, John records, But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. We have an advocate, we have a, a parakletos, and in this case, it's Jesus. See, the point here. And the point in John's mind is that the Holy Spirit advocate that we see in our passage in John 14 is continuing the same ministry that Jesus provided for his original disciples. There's perfect continuity between the ministries of Jesus and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. All right, I'm ready to ask some more questions. Have you ever considered how great it would be have access to Jesus like the disciples did? Or maybe you've thought, if I could just see Jesus, he could tell me how to live my life and what to do with my work and whatever else. It's incredibly tempting to think this way. If only Jesus were here, then we could get it all right. But let's think about this for a second, though. Let's think about if Jesus were actually still here on earth. Can you imagine it? He was incarnate as a human, a real human body, a real human being, and he had physical constraints on that human body. And though in his glorified body he seems to be able to do things that, that normal bodies can't do, like pass through locked doors to, to disappear one place and show up another place, it seems, though, that he can only be in one place at a time. So let's say he goes back to the Sea of Galilee and he begins to preach and teach again in his resurrected form. He doesn't ascend to heaven. He stays on earth. He doesn't die because he's in, a glorified, he's in his glorified form. There's no sickness or death in him anymore. So he's not going to die. Can you imagine how big the crowds would be? No plane ticket could be purchased, no boat could be procured, no train from Europe could ever be, be afforded in order to get anywhere near Israel. You think it's hard to get Taylor Swift tickets right now? <laughs> and even if you could manage to get a Taylor Swift ticket, how many of those people you, do you think go to her concerts how many of them do you think have ever had her become an advocate for them? Now, even though Jesus is better than Taylor Swift by an order of magnitude, somewhere around the size of the universe, the point is that if Jesus desired to have the same relationship with everyone in the world in his incarnate form on earth, it could not happen. 
It can only be in so many places. So enter here the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit paraclete. A different advocate. The same one in, in nature and mission offering the same advocacy, the same comfort that the disciples had in Jesus, yet now available for everyone. The Holy Spirit will come alongside us and, and indeed live within us to provide the same wisdom, guidance, and healing that Jesus provided. Through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God, the very presence of the triune God dwells within us. Have you grappled with that reality? See, if the words of Scripture are true, which I believe they are, then we have to face the reality that the Spirit of the living God dwells within us. Jesus made this promise and he is trustworthy. Now, at the risk of sounding overly obvious or overly simplistic, the the point of this morning's sermon is to say that you are not alone. Even if you were stranded on a desert island or the last person left alive on on the earth, you would not be alone. An advocate in the Holy Spirit lives within you if you believe and trust in Jesus. In those moments where you feel alone and it feels like the whole world is against you, there is an advocate in the Holy Spirit. In those moments where you want to be alone, there is a comforter. In those moments where you think you've messed up too much, where you're beyond redemption, there's one who is advocating with the Father on your behalf day and night. He has promised that he will not leave you as an orphan. We will no doubt discuss more in how to hear from the Holy Spirit and how to experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the weeks to come as we, pers- as we press on toward Pentecost. But for now, I think it's worth taking a moment to rest in and allow our souls to settle in the fact that the Holy Spirit, that the living God, dwells within us. Romans 8, 11 says, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. And that he is bringing you life. I believe that as we see ourselves this way, as we take on the identity of those who are indwelled with the Holy Spirit, with an advocate who can never be taken from us, We will find a sense of security and boldness that will drive away anxiety and fear. No matter what comes, even if we take a stand for something we believe and it causes everyone in the world to hate us, we will never be alone. The Holy Spirit will always be there to offer wisdom, guidance, and healing. The, all of these things, the ministry of Jesus continuing on in our lives. And as we receive, so we can give, right? As we are loved by God, then we can love others. So then, as we receive the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we can be used to minister to others. There's a whole world full of anxious and lonely people. May the God of peace, which passes understanding, use us to invite others into the rest that only comes through God. Only through the presence, God's promised presence in our lives. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.